this morning I'm going to speak to you from John 5. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd love you to turn there with me this morning. And um, I came across this story a while ago and it piqued my interest. And, um, and as I looked more into it, it got more and more interesting. And hopefully this morning it's going to help us. So we're going to dive straight in this morning to the Word. And we're going to read in John chapter 5. It'll come up on the screens if you've not got your Bible with you this morning. And it says this. John chapter 5, verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Now this next bit sounds really, I hear things obviously in British in my head, but this sounds super British. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? No Australian's ever going to say that, but so they must have had a bit of British in them, I reckon. The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you're well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. This morning, just before we start, I want you to, as much as you can this morning, to open up your heart. I know that none of us come into church wanting to leave the same way that we came in. We want to meet this morning, don't we, with a living God who is able to move us from where we are and move us on. And so with that, let's pray this morning and just ask Jesus to help us. Jesus, we thank you that you are here, you're in the room, you want to do some stuff. And, and we make the decision right now to not think about the rest of the day, to not think about the worries of the week, to not think about the, the million and one things that we could consider ourselves with. But we decide this morning, Jesus, right now to focus into you, to dial into your presence, into what you want to say to us, into what you want to do in our lives. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, have your way. Do what you want to do. We open up our lives to you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 So just a really quick bit of background before we dive in. Obviously, we're in the book of John. That's called a gospel, if you don't already know that. And there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so John's a little bit different from all the other gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. And that means that they kind of see things from the same sort of perspective. But John's quite a different book. And it's not that they're talking about a different Jesus, or well, my college lecturer explained it to me like this. He said that it's like looking at a diamond from a different perspective. They're looking at the same thing, but because they're seeing a different facet, it's, it's like a different sort of beautiful, which I thought was a nice way of explaining it. And so in John, what we have is we have something called high Christology. Can you say that with me this morning? High Christology. It sounds really fancy. All it means is that John's um, picture, the facet of Jesus that he's seeing is Jesus as all-powerful. Like really powerful Jesus. At the end of the book, it says that Jesus lays his life down. Nobody takes Jesus's life in the book of John. He lays his life down for his friends and for his followers and for us. And in Mark, you get things like Jesus spitting on the floor, making some mud, smearing it on a guy's eyes and then sending him away. You'd never get that in John. And you'll see why in just a minute. We'll have a look in the story and you'll see these little bits of what we call high Christology. And so where this story is happening, it tells us right at the start that a festival is going on, which means that Jerusalem is super, super busy. 
because people have come from all over the known world that were Jews and it was their job at festival time to come and to come and gather with other Jews and so it's a really busy time and then this story is happening at a place just outside the sheep gate which sounds exciting and because I'm a visual person I brought a map because that helps me so have a little look so right up at the top, can you see it kind of in the top right-hand corner? There's the sheep gate. The Pool of Bethesda, where our story happens, is outside there. And you can see that's all happening in the shadow of the temple. So we're kind of in the top end of Jerusalem where this is happening. And so we've got the sheep gate. We've got the Pool of Bethesda. And then if you can go to the next side, this is what the Pool of Bethesda, what they think it looks like, is these two pools here. It's just really interesting because... It talks about the five colonnades, which is a, a really common architectural um, feature. Kind of, if you were going to build a house, you'd build some colonnades with it. And so, when people were reading this centuries ago, they were looking, because it says it was a five sided pool. So, they're looking, when they're digging in the archaeology, they're looking for a pentagram shaped pool. And they couldn't find one. So, they're thinking, well, maybe the person who wrote the book of John didn't really know what was going on. Maybe they weren't around in Jerusalem. And then in about the 1900s, about 1964, they found this, this pool, which is five-sided. Can you see? It's like, it's a rectangle and then it's got that colonnade in the middle. So it's a five-sided pool. And so they were like, well, maybe the person did know what they were talking about. And it kind of helped to kind of solidify the fact that it, it is a historical document and it happened in real life. And so that's what the Pool of Bethesda looks like. So I want you to keep that in your mind. And that, see that little doorway right at the top? That's the Sheep Gate. So it's close to Jerusalem, but it's outside. It's outside Jerusalem. And that's going to become important a little bit later. And it's called Bethesda, which is interesting because it's got two meanings, which is why I've called my preach this morning a tale of two houses. And you'll find out why a little bit later. But Bethesda can mean a house of kindness, mercy, and grace. Sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? I'd like that to be my house. But it can also mean a house of cruelty, shame, or disgrace. So it's got this double meaning. It can mean either. And, um, and then in verse Three, we find out that this place is filled with the blind and the lame and the paralyzed, which is even more interesting because why are they all congregating here and why is that outside of Jerusalem? And then if you were reading carefully along in your Bible, you might have noticed that as we're reading, we went from John 5 verse 1, 2, 3. And then when you go home and look at this in your Bible, unless you've got the very old King James, you'll find that there is no verse 4. Verse 4 has mysteriously disappeared, and we skip straight to verse 5. And I thought it wouldn't be right for us just to kind of gloss over that, because you might be looking at that thinking, well, where's verse 4? Like, did they just forget to copy it down, or like, was somebody sleeping, or did they like have a nap when they were copying, or did it get, spill their tea on it? Like, where, what happened to verse 4? But the reason, you'll see it as a footnote, but the reason why it's not included in the text is because in the 24 best copies of the Gospel of John that we have, it's not actually in there. And, and they've all got a little asterisk next to verse 4 that says, we don't actually think this bit is, is legit. Like, we think the person who was writing it kind of put their own spin on it. Because it talks about, in verse 4, how at the pool an angel used to come and stir the waters. And then when that had happened, people used to jump in and then they'd be healed which is a bit contrary to how we know God works, right? That doesn't kind of sit well with you about the character of God, that he'd send an angel to do this kind of healing lottery where if you are first in the water, you get healed. That's not really consistent with the character of God. And so that's why verse 4 isn't there, because it's not an original part of the text, but you'll see it in a footnote. So verse 5, we're going to get into it right now. We find this guy our guy in the story, and we find out that he's been an invalid for 38 years. Later in the story, we find out that he's a Jew because he goes to the temple after he's been healed, probably to present himself, to check that he's been healed, and to also get reinstated into the community. But he's in this pool which is outside of Jerusalem, which is an odd place. Like that, it, it's, it's interesting and strange that the pool is outside Jerusalem. So why is that happening? 
And why is this guy there? And so if he's been an invalid for 38 years, his life is not all hunky-dory. He's, he's got a hard life. He has to beg for everything because he's seen as like on the bottom rung of society. He wouldn't have been able to have a job. He wouldn't have had a family. He would have literally been living hand to mouth, just relying on the generosity of people, giving him money so that he could even eat. And so he's in a pretty bad way. And then we find him at this pool, which make, I would have been a very um, precocious child, I reckon. I should ask my mum about this. But I had a bazillion questions when I read this. I was like, why is this guy at the pool? Why is he there? Why is there a pool full of sick people? That seems rather strange to me. Why is this pool outside of Jerusalem in the first place? Because if it's outside the city walls, that's interesting. And then why is Jesus here of all places? Why, why do we find Jesus here? What's going on? And the pool position really helps us. The pool tells us where it is, tells us that something is going on here that is not tolerated inside the city walls. Because Jerusalem was like this religious city. Um, it had lots of different influences, but it was, it was a very religious city. And so if something's been strategically placed outside, then that's interesting because it means that whatever's happening there is not allowed to happen inside the city. So what's going on here? Remember we had that double meaning about the houses, about it being a house of shame and disgrace and cruelty and then kindness and grace and mercy? What we actually find out when we dig into this a little bit further is that this pool is called an Asclepion. Can you say that with me? Asclepion. See, you're more clever than you when you came in this morning. So if nothing else, you've learned a new word this morning. So it's called an Asclepion. And that's because there was a guy called, funnily enough, Asclepius. And he was this Greco-Roman god of healing. And he had this huge cult that surrounded him that was all to do with him being, get this, a benevolent, kind savior who was able to raise people from the dead. That's who Asclepius was set up to be. And he would have these healing temples set up around pools. And people would go to them to be able to be healed. And so Asclepions were where kind of primitive medicine started. So Hippocrates, where you'll know this at least, where we get the Hippocratic Oath from, that all doctors have to take, that they'll do no harm. Hippocrates studied under this guy called Asclepius, who then through legend became a god and all this different interesting stuff that happened. And so in Asclepion's primitive medicine is happening. People are getting their boils popped and all sorts of different things in the, in the, you didn't think you'd hear that when you came to church this morning, did you? It's not in my notes. I don't know why I said that. So all this primitive medicine is happening in this Asclepion's, but it's also uh, kind of a place of myth and legend around this guy, Asclepius, who's this benevolent person who's going to come and heal you and so because of that like the Jews are not okay with this which is why it's outside the city which begs the question why is this guy why is our guy in the story a Jewish man why is he here because he really shouldn't be here as a Jew for him to be in an Asclepion in a pagan healing temple If his life was going bad before, he would be absolutely barred from society, even just being in a place like this. So why is he here? Why has he made this life choice? And I reckon you and I can answer that because he's probably desperate. Like the only reason why you're going to make that step where you're going to be completely cut off from society is if you have absolutely no other option, right? And so he must be completely out of options to even make the decision, I'm going to go to this place. And yet here is where we find him. He's exhausted all these other options. And part of the the kind of legends around the Asclepians was that if you'd, say say you'd gone with a a broken ankle, and because they did have some sort of primitive medicine, they did set bones and things like that. But say you'd gone with your broken ankle and then your ankle got healed, it was really common for you to be thankful for that. And so you'd go and you'd get a bronze 
ankle cast and then you'd take it back to the asclepion yarn and they'd put it up like a little trophy. So you'd have all these different body parts around the asclepion yarn of like healing testimonies of look, this person got their nose sorted out or this person got their ears fixed or whatever it was. And so this guy, our guy, he's in this place, he's not supposed to be there. Him being there is a terrible life decision for him and maybe he's actually surrounded by trophies of healing for what he needs because he's an invalid, he's paralyzed, he can't walk. And how desperate must he have been to be in this situation? And here's the first thing that I want us to take home today. It's this. Here's what I get from, from this guy being here. is that no matter how bad, desperate, or hopeless the situation that you're in may seem, Jesus will always come and find you wherever you are, even if you're in totally the wrong place. This dude should not have been here at all, ever. It was the wrong place for him to be on, on a societal level, on an emotional level. Can you imagine if you're sick, being in a place where, where and this is your only option, is that all the things like there's hope here, but there's also despair and all that kind of stuff. And yet, in the middle of that, where he should not be, Jesus comes and finds him. Jesus seeks him out. Often in the stories, in the Gospels, you'll see people coming to Jesus. Or, you know, there's the stories of the blind man shouting out for Jesus. And none of this is in this story. This is what we call the high Christology. It's Jesus comes and finds him. He goes to where he is. And this morning, we might think, well, that's lovely, but how does that affect me? What does that mean for me? It means this morning that there's no place that you can run to in your spiritual life. There's no hole that you can dig. There's no situation too difficult, no circumstance too hopeless, no sin habit that you've repeated yourself into that Jesus isn't willing and able and already on the way to where you are. It gives me such hope this morning because this guy shouldn't have been there and yet Jesus finds him in that place anyway. And this morning we can get ourselves through different circumstances, sometimes through our own fault, sometimes through no fault of our own. We can find ourselves in places where we're never supposed to be and think that Jesus is not going to find us there but he will and he's coming and he's on his way and I want you to notice what he doesn't do he doesn't go in and go well made some bad life decisions haven't you gosh I can't believe you're here you're a Jew and you shouldn't be here and that's really awkward and um, I'm just going to condemn you right now because and judge you because it's just really bad that you're here. Like none of that happens. Jesus doesn't condemn him. He doesn't berate him. He doesn't bring conviction on him. Because I, I kind of reckon he's doing that himself. Yeah? We do that ourselves, don't we? When we've got ourselves into a situation where we know we shouldn't be, in our thoughts or in our habits or with our family, whatever it might be, you know you've done something wrong. You, you are your own worst critic, aren't you? You don't need somebody to come and tell you that you've been doing it wrong. Because you know. We all know. But Jesus comes and doesn't do any of that. He reaches in. He meets him where he's at. And this morning, wherever you are, whatever, my gran would have said it this way, whatever pickle you're in, that's what she used to say, if you're in a pickle, whatever pickle you're in this morning, no matter how you've ended up there, it doesn't actually matter because Jesus is going to meet you in your pickle, in your circumstance, where you shouldn't be. He's going to meet you right where you're at which this morning encourages my heart. I think, thank you, Lord, for that, that I don't deserve it, and yet you're going to come and find me anyway. And in verse 6, it talks about Jesus comes, and, he, and he, finds, he finds our guy. Our guy's not seeking Jesus out. Jesus comes and finds him. Out of the hundreds of people, could have gone to hundreds of people in this place, and he comes and finds our guy. And then, I love this, Jesus knows. It says this. Jesus saw him lying there and learned, which in the Greek is a word called gnosis. Gnosis? Gnosis, gnosis that's right now. And it means this, that he came to know, recognized, and perceived that he had been in this condition for a long time. And that's how we get this high Christology. Jesus is not asking a question. He's not having a good nosy around with people and saying, do you know this guy? How long has he been here? He's not asking a load of questions. Jesus seeks him out finds him, 
and knows. Nobody needs to tell Jesus. Jesus knows what's going on. And just as an aside to this, sometimes we, we slip into the, the faulty thinking that Jesus doesn't actually know what's going on in our life. Like that's even a thing that is possible, but we act like that's true. Because what we do is we hide stuff from him. Because we think if Jesus really knew, if I confess that to him, what will, will, will he accept me? Will he love me? Will I still be able to be in leadership? Could I be on team? Will, will he actually still love me if he, if he really knew? And we do it with people all the time. If they really knew what I was like, if they could see my thought life, if they could see my internet history, if they could see the habits that I have, if they could see how I get angry at a moment's notice without being able to stop it, if they could see that, if they really knew the real me, then they wouldn't actually love me. They'd be disgusted. They'd turn away. And what we tend to do is we tend to do what our first parents did with Adam and Eve. We tend to, when we feel ashamed of something, we tend to run and hide. We tend to hide it and we tend to keep it in secrets and we tend to lie. So what we, what we do is our natural thing is to cover up. And that's where the enemy lives. The enemy of our soul lives in secrecy and condemnation and lies. And he will lie to you and tell you that if anybody knew what was going on in your life, if they really knew, then they would reject you completely. And I've seen time and time and time again the beauty of when somebody takes that incredibly brave step with a Christian who they love and trust and says, listen, this is what's going on for me. I know it's ugly. I know, and it's honestly, it's the scariest thing in the world to do this. And I know because I've done it to say, this is what's going on and have that pause where you're so sure the person's going to go, well, this is it. Please get away from me. This relationship's over and to walk away. And when the person turns around and says, well, I still love you. It's okay. We'll work through it together. That, that, that process is freeing, scary, but freeing. And Jesus knows anyway. And so don't lie to yourself and believe the lie of the enemy that if Jesus really knew, he'd be so disgusted because he knows. Jesus knew what was going on for this guy and wasn't disgusted by him, didn't turn his back on him. He found him knowing the mess that his life was in. So this morning, don't hide your stuff from Jesus. Bring it to him, reveal it and get it healed. And Jesus comes to him. He knows what's going on. And then he asks him this question. He says, do you want to get well? Right? That's a rather obvious question. Can we agree? <laughs> yeah? So, and we've just learned that Jesus knows. He, he perceived and knew that this guy had been sick for 38 years and he didn't ask him. So I'm fairly sure that Jesus would also have been able to know that he wanted to get well, yes? Can we agree on that? So, so this is a bizarre question. Why is Jesus asking a question he already knows the answer to? Because he doesn't need to ask the question. So why is it here? Why is it in the Bible? Why is he asking it to this guy? And I reckon it's because there's something going on here where he wants to reveal something in our guy's heart and to unlock an opportunity for him. That's what I think might be going on here. And so Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? What's the obvious answer to that? Yes. yes. That would be the obvious answer. Yes, please. I would like to be well. But he doesn't say that. What he says is, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, while I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me. That's not the obvious answer. He, if we're going by a script, he should have just said, yes, please, Jesus. And then Jesus would have healed him. And then that would have been the end of the story. But he doesn't. He replies with this strange answer. And you need a bit of background to understand why he's answering like this. So we know that this guy, our guy, he's at an Asclepion where there's pools of water, and it's to do with this cult around this guy called Asclepius, which is the god of healing. And so here's the process that happened. When you went to an Asclepion, two things happened. The first is that you went through something called catharsis. 
which is where we get the word cathartic from. You know that feeling when you've cleaned your kitchen cupboards and it's really great and clean? Maybe that's just me. That's cathartic for me when, I, when my kitchen cupboards are clean. And so that's where we get the word cathartic from. So they'd have to go through something called catharsis, which is where they'd go into the pools of water and they'd get themselves clean which in the ancient world would probably sort out a whole load of diseases and illnesses just right there and then. So they're going in, they're getting themselves clean. They often get ceremonial clothes, and then they have to pay some money. They have to do an offering to be part of the Asclepion and be part of something that's going on. And then the second thing that happens is they have this process called incubation which is obviously where we get incubators and all that kind of stuff from, which is, it was this process of dream sleep, which they often used to give them opiates to help them to go to sleep. And they, you'd sleep in the colonnades. And so you'd, you've, have, you, you've had your nice bath. It's like a really old-fashioned spa. So you've had your nice bath, you've paid your money, and then, and then uh, no opiates in the spas that I go to. And then, and then they put you in the colonnades, and then they give you some stuff to help you sleep. And then the hope is, is that as you sleep, you have a dream about Asclepius. That's the hope, is that he comes to you in a dream, and he might come to you as Asclepius, which is really unusual for the time, because ordinarily, if you met a Roman god, you'd die instantly. And, but remember, Asclepius is a benevolent, kind savior. Okay, so you want him to appear to you in your sleep. Or he might appear as a little boy, or he might appear as a dog, that would be my favorite, or least favorite, he might appear as a snake. I'd be like, this is some sort of nightmare. And so then hopefully he's going to appear to you in a dream, and he'll tell you something, but you're not clever enough to interpret this on your own, and so then in the morning when you wake up, you have to pay some money, and then a priest will interpret the dream for you, and then he'll give you a prescription. He'll tell you what the dream means and what you need to do. Can you see how this is a nice little money-making business? Because, you know, you've got to pay for your clothes and your bath and then your dreams and all the different things that are going on. And so often uh, a prescription would be to get in the water, to have a bath in the water, but not just any time. You needed to have a bath when the water was stirred, which is probably where that legend about the angel came from. But really more often what happened was that these pools were around like natural springs and so they'd have to wait for the bubbles to bubble up with the natural springs but then that was a bit unreliable and so what they used to do is put pipes in and so they blow some water it, like blow some air into the pipes so that it would bubble because that was a bit more cost effective than having to wait for the natural spring to bubble or and this again my least favorite thing they put a load of snakes in like worst day ever. If I went to my doctor and they were like, here's the prescription, have a bath with a load of snakes, I'd be like, do you know what? I'm good being sick. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave that out. Thank you very much. And so they used to release all these ceremonial snakes in and then you'd have to get in the water, which is my idea of a nightmare. And then what's really fascinating is that even in the ancient world, when this cult first started, miracles used to happen instantly. So people used to do something, and then they'd be instantly healed. But even by the time that we get to Jesus, so this cult's been going on at least 300 years by the time that we get to this point, is that people have gotten way more skeptical. And so they don't really believe in instant miracles anymore. And so what they have to do is that there now is a healing industry where you need your prescription and you need to do this and then you need to do that. And maybe the first dream didn't work, need to work. And so you have to stay another night and you've got to pay some more money and have a more, another dream reinterpreted and you need this and you need that. And it become this self-sustaining industry all based around money. And so our guy, remember he's here, and so he's been given, more than likely from what we can tell from the text, a prescription to get into the water. That's what he's been told he needs to do to be healed, to get into the water. But not only into the water, but into the water first. Because he says to Jesus, I'm trying to get into the water, but when I do, somebody else gets in there before me. But here's, here's the thing that's really upsetting about this whole situation. This guy is desperate, yes? We agreed that at the start. He's, he's, he's in a desperate situation, 
and he enters into this Asclepion and puts himself in a system that is stacked against him. He's entered into a healing system that is all about how much money he has and how quickly he can get in. And think about this. He's, we know from the text he's there with lame people, blind people, paralyzed people. And probably lots of them had the same prescription, get into the water when it stirs, get in first. So just imagine what happens when you're in the Asclepion, you're around the pool, they blow the water through, or they put the snakes in, whatever they do, and the water bubbles, what is going to happen? Everyone's going in, aren't you? If that was you, they're all in. And so you've got the most vulnerable, the most damaged, the most sick people, poorly people in society, in this cruel lottery to try and throw themselves into a pool first. And then imagine that one person might come up and be like, ah, oh, I'm healed. Well, what about the hundreds of other people have to then drag themselves back out the pool and go, ah, oh, not for me. Again, maybe tomorrow, maybe later in the day, maybe tomorrow. How many days did this guy do this? How many years had he been here waiting? How many other people were with him just waiting for that moment, failing every time? How must Jesus have felt when he walked into this place, when healing walked into the place that's had a healing industry set up to take advantage of the most poor, the most sick, the most desperate in society, and yet this guy is here. Remember at the start we talked about the Bethesda, that double meaning? This place is not a house of grace and mercy and kindness. This is a house based on cruelty, based on shame, based on disgrace. How must you feel when you've got to drag yourself? No one there to help you. You've got to drag yourself, your paralyzed body, out of a pool, sit there sopping wet, and be like, maybe, maybe tomorrow. I'll pay some more money, get another dream interpreted. Maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. How would we feel if that was us? It's just desperate. It's just the most desperate thing. And so I reckon that's why our guy doesn't say to Jesus, when he asks him, do you want to be well? He doesn't say yes, because that's not even an option for him. He can't even see that yes is a logical response, that yes is, is even available in the situation to him. And what he does is healing comes to him and says, do you want to be made well? And he looks healing right in the face and gives him all the reasons why that can't happen. And here's the second takeaway that I want you to take home today. All of us need to stop looking our answer in the face and saying why the situations in our life, why they're impossible and why they can't happen. We can look at this guy and judge him and think, oh, well, we should sort that out. You know, we would never do that. But we do this all the time. I did it this week as I was preparing this preach, and then Jesus was like, really? You've just written that down. You've got to preach it to people. And I was like, dang it. So I did. So I've got to sort it out. And what we do all the time is, is we, we look Jesus in the face and tell him the problem. We say to him, this is why this is not going to work. This is why provision is not going to come. This is why healing can't work. This is why my faith is like it is. This is why my family's never going to get saved. This, and we talk to Jesus and just tell him the problem. But this morning, there is no circumstance. There is no problem. There is no reason that is too far gone, too hard, too impossible. Because we serve the God of the impossible. That's who we serve. That's our God. He's not like, you know, able to come through in some circumstances when he feels like it and only on a Tuesday. Like, that's not him. Our God is the God that is able to do immeasurably more. All that we can ask and think above and beyond what we ever ask or imagine. And so instead of standing, looking Jesus in the face and saying to him, here's why this is not going to work for me, what we need to do is turn around, have Jesus at our back, look at the problem and say, look who's with me. My God is able to do more. My God is able to heal me. My God is my peace. He's my joy. He's my strength. He's what I need. And so we need to remind our problem so often of who's with us, that he's got our back. He goes before us. He sings over us at night. 
look who's with us. And so this guy, bless him, he looks healing in the face and says, this is why it's not going to happen for me, which is a crazy thing, but yet we do it all the time. And maybe our guy's best hope, because he doesn't recognize who's there. If he recognized who was there, he'd be like, do it now. Because he, if he knew that the embodiment of healing, that life and peace and wholeness and strength and breakthrough was right there, you and I would not answer, well, I can't because I, I need to get into the pool. We wouldn't. We'd answer, yes, please, do it, Lord. But his best hope is that Jesus is going to stick around and help push him in the pool first. That's probably the best hope that he has. But he doesn't even ask that because so far gone is this guy. So ostracized, so hopeless, so far away from any thinking is that he's able to get healing. And Jesus cuts right across this hopelessness and this healing industry that is all about pay your money, do your prescription, get in the water, have your dream sleep, have do this, that, and the other, then make your little effigy and bring it back. He cuts across all of that, and he simply says to the guy, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Like, boom, straight across. Like, here's the healing industry, and word to you. Like, just go straight for it, straight healing. And that's where we get this high Christology. Jesus doesn't even touch him. He doesn't need this guy's faith. Often you'll see in the Gospels where healings happen, it's in response to some faith on somebody's part. There's no faith in this story. This guy hasn't even gone looking for Jesus. Jesus comes and finds him. He doesn't have any faith. He doesn't even touch him. He doesn't give him special instructions. You'll find a story later in John about this guy who's blind and then he, he has to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. None of that. Jesus comes and he just gives the word and the guy's healed. He just says, get up, pick up your mat, and on your way. And I love that because what that shows me is the creative word of God. That, and think about this. This just boggles my head, right? So this guy, he's paralyzed. So if you know anything about kind of muscles and stuff like that. My dad was ill a while ago and, and he had to kind of keep moving and they had to do some physio because he was um, in hospital for a long time. And so his muscles started to waste and so the physio would come and like bend his legs and stuff, which he used to hate and all that kind of stuff. And so, but this guy's been paralyzed for 38 years and I'm guessing there's no temple physio kind of, you know, come in and bend your leg today. I'm guessing that's not happening. And so in the instant that Jesus says to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Creative miracles are happening, right? Some muscles are being regrown. Tendons are being reattached. If this bone dense, because his bones would have been brittle and unable to hold his weight, all of that's being sorted. If, if this was something that had happened to him in the womb, his chromosomes are being redone to sort it out. Or if, you know, it's an accident and things had happened and maybe it was something in his spinal cord. And as Jesus says the words, he's not saying spinal cord reattach, muscles grow, tenors come back, bones get strengthened, and there you go. Like, none of that. He just says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And this creative miracle happens at the word of God. And this morning, I want to remind you, you're made in that God's image. You're made in a creative God's image. He's made us like him. And in Proverbs 18, 21, it reminds us that we have got the power of life and death in our tongues. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm that good that, you know, if I said, that, wouldn't it be awesome if this just happened and Jesus is like, ah, oh. but it won't, I don't think. But if I said stage be white, no, see, that will, can you imagine if that would have happened? We all would have been like, whoa, but it didn't. So if I said stage be white and it just turned white because we, we got that creative element to our speech. That's why Proverbs says to us, careful what you talk about, careful what you say with your tongue, because what you say can bring life or it can bring death. And if you've had a teacher that said bad stuff to you, you'll know that because it stays with you forever. You'll know that with that, un, you know, if you're having a work review and they're like, all right, here's five things you did well and here's one thing to improve on. What do you go away with? You go away on like that, oh my goodness, that one thing I need to improve on because that's how we're hardwired. And yet we're made in God's image. 
in a creative God image. Band, I wonder if you could come back up now, please. And so Jesus does this creative miracle. He speaks the words, and this guy is healed. He just says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. The miracle happens. But I want to revisit this thing about Bethesda. Remember we said right at the start that it's got that double meaning. It's got that um, two-part meaning where it can be a house of grace and mercy and kindness, or it can be a house of cruelty, shame, and disgrace. Our guy is in this place, and before Jesus comes in, that is his reality. This house is a house of cruelty. He's in a cruel system. It's shame and it's disgrace to him. He shouldn't have been there. He's fallen prey to this false promise of healing. It's not, it's, it's never coming for him. He's never going to get his healing. And yet he's being promised and told over and over and over again, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And yet there is no power in this place to heal him aside from when Jesus walks in. He's being kept a prisoner to his own hopes and desperation. And in the middle of this house of cruelty, shame and disgrace, Jesus seeks him out. He finds him. He knows him. Remember, he divinely knows what's going on. He knows everything about this guy. He speaks to him and then he heals him. And he takes this house of cruelty, shame and disgrace and transforms it for this guy into a place he will forever remember where it became a house of kindness, where he experienced the kindness of Jesus and mercy and grace. And it's such a beautiful picture of the gospel story. That's what Jesus did for you and me. Can you see yourself in this story? That like the guy, we weren't looking for Jesus. You might have been feeling like you were searching for him, but way before that, before even the intent of your heart was, I think I need to find something about this. Jesus was pursuing you. He was coming after you. He was coming to find you. And he knows you and I this morning. He knows everything we've ever done. And he doesn't walk away from us in disgust and go, how filthy, I can't, I can't even be around you. What he says is, I know, and he speaks the word, and he's able to heal us. And this morning, I want to challenge us about the areas of our life that have slipped into shame or disgrace, the parts of our life that feel cruel sometimes, you feel like this is cruel, I shouldn't be going through this, or this person that I love, it feels cruel that they're even going through that. It's in those very places, it's in those houses of cruelty, shame, and disgrace that Jesus is going to come and find you, know you, speak to you, and take it and make it a house of kindness, mercy, and grace. And so this morning, I really encourage you to bring those circumstances, bring them to Jesus, because he already knows. He already knows. He's not disgusted with us this morning. And to allow him, allow him to do what he can do. Instead of looking at Jesus and saying, this is why this can't ever happen. This is why this is impossible. This is why, here are all the reasons why this is just not going to work for me, Jesus. This morning, turn around, face the problem and say, look who's with me. King of the world is with me able to do immeasurably more than I can ever ask, think, or imagine, mighty to save, strong tower, rejoices over me with singing, and look at the problem and tell the problem who's with you, who's got your back, who's on your side, who's going to intervene on your behalf. And so I wonder if we could all stand this morning. I want to do two things, if you'd close your eyes with me, with every Christian praying in the place right now. If as I was talking, you know that you're not right with Jesus, that you've not yet taken the decision to make him your Lord and your Savior, I don't ever want to presume that everybody in the room is a Christian. Because even many of us who come to church spend a lot of time in church and yet don't know a living Savior. 
And so this morning, if you recognize that that's you, listen, Jesus is in the room this morning. He's seeking and finding you. He's coming to you this morning, knowing everything about you and still choosing you a million times over. And so if you want to receive Jesus this morning, if you want to say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I want you to make me new. I want you to take my shame and my disgrace and give me mercy and kindness in the place. If that's you this morning, I just want to give you an opportunity. I'd love to pray with you. If that's you, would you put your hand really quickly and I'll see it and we'll pray together. Is there anybody here this morning? Last chance. Okay. And then if you're a Christian in this place, this morning I want to remind you that Jesus sees you in the crowd. In the crowd of this room, he sees you. He knows what you need. And this morning he's asking you, do you want to be well? That area of sickness, that area of sin, that area of the thought life, that area that is yet submitted to him. He's coming to you and he's asking, do you want to be well? And this morning, what I'd like us to do is I'd like us to close our eyes and I'd like you just to take a moment to speak to your Savior as he asks you the question this morning, do you want to be well? And instead of giving Jesus a lot of reasons why, why that can't happen, just say to Jesus this morning, yes, please. You just talk to him right now. I'm going to be quiet for a moment. And I want you to talk to him. And I want you to tell him what you need this morning. And listen as he responds to you. Do you do that now? we're so grateful that you would find us when we don't deserve you and that you know us and that you're here this morning to help move us on you don't want us to stay stuck in our pool of Bethesda you want us to be able to move forward so this morning Lord Jesus the cry of our heart is yes please. We don't have all the answers. We don't know how it's going to work out. We don't know how it's going to end up. But the cry of our heart is, yes, please. We want to be well. We want you to help this morning, Lord Jesus. And so we say yes to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you need to talk to somebody, one of the pastors, I encourage you to come down the front at the end. We'd love to chat to you if that stirred something for you. Um, we're always here for you to talk and to pray with you. We'd love to do that. We'd be so honored to do that with you this morning. We just want to encourage you to come back this evening, six o'clock for our baptisms. I remember be talking as you go home with your family about Heart for the House. We're so excited about the opportunity for Heart for the House. It's not like a have to, it's like we get to. And so have that conversation as you go home with your family. And um, let's go out praising our God this morning. Thanks, Jess. <laughs>